I'm going to go through and use the strategies that we covered in one paragraph, and then I'm going to give you the opportunity to read through the rest of the paragraph. The link to this uh, article is on the first, this slide right here, it's the first link, so you'll have access to that as well. But the big thing is, is we're going to be trying out writing a bottom line summary, and we're also going to be trying out uh, using ICE and also highlighting. So I'm showing you all three so that you have examples of all three. When you're practicing, I would highly recommend sticking to ICE and either your preferred method, so either highlighting or writing a bottom line summary. Typically what students do is they use ICE and they practice writing the bottom line summary because those are the two things that people just wanna try out and are more challenging for them. So I'll just show you all three as an example, but I'd recommend starting off with ICE and the bottom line summary. So I'm gonna go ahead and read through this and give you some examples of how to go through it with ICE. So again, it's introduction, conclusion, or example, evidence, and explanation. So here it says in the Brancacci Chapel of the Florentine Church of the Carmine, Masaccio and Monsignor painted frescoes of two important biblical events. So we've got some churches, they're kind of setting the scene for us. We have two artists and these two artists painted very important biblical events. So, so far we have no evidence or examples about who these artists are or what they painted and how they painted stuff. So this would just be an introduction sentence because we're learning about these artists for the first time and we're learning about these biblical events as well. And then these scenes representing respectively the temptation and the expulsion of Adam and Eve act as a visual and thematic overture to the cycle. Together, they represent the fall of man. So this sentence is interesting because it's telling us what the two biblical scenes are. It's a temptation and the expulsion of Adam and Eve. We now also know the subject of the painting, which is Adam and Eve. And it also tells us a little bit more about why this kind of two paintings are important. The two paintings, this whole thing about the thematic overture to the cycle, I'm just gonna ignore it because I honestly don't know what it means. So when the AMC throws confusing stuff like that at you, the easiest thing to do is just look at the stuff before it and look at the stuff after it. Because usually after it, they explain it and there will be some context. So we know it's about Adam and Eve, and we know that these two paintings together show a bigger event in the Bible called the fall of man. So this is a little bit of an example because it tells us what the two Bible events are, but it's mostly an introduction. So keep in mind that some sentences can kind of go between the two categories, depending on what kind of information they give you. So it's mostly an introduction because this is the first time we're learning about who these paintings are about and this idea of the fall of man. But it's a little bit of an example just because we know the two important biblical events. Then it says in both images, Adam and Eve are rendered full length and in proximity to one another. So this finally tells us like, okay, if the paintings are about Adam and Eve, here are how they're actually painted. So it's a good example of what a painting of Adam and Eve would look like. Executed by Masani Masaccio, the two images epitomize the stylistic contrast between the slender elegance of Gothic figures and the new pathos of Renaissance bodies. So it's telling us that the paintings were done by the two guys they mentioned earlier, the two images that they painted, which are these two right here, uh, were done in different styles. So one guy did it in Gothic and the other one did it in Renaissance bodies. So it's another example of how these paintings were actually done by the two artists, which when we started off reading it, we just didn't know anything about. So good example sentences. So, so far we have a number of different ideas. We know that it's about biblical events. We know it's about these two guys, these two painters. We know the subject of the painting is Adam and Eve and it relates to this bigger idea of the fall. And they gave some examples, but we don't know why any of this is important. And so that's what we want to look for when you read on. The contrast is all the more significant when one considers that the two images are not discrete portions of a larger narrative of Genesis, but form a two-part visualization of the fall as a dramatic change in humanity. So now it's telling us that the difference in their art styles with that contrast is all the more significant, aka important, when you consider or think about that the two images they painted, the temptation and the expulsion, are not standalone parts of the narrative of Genesis, so they're not just like two parts that don't have any relationship to one another, but that they come together to form a two-part visualization of the fall 
So it shows the fall in kind of like two different ways and also tells us that the fall is a very dramatic change in humanity. So it's finally tying in all the ideas that we read about earlier and it's telling us why it's important. It's important that these two artists had two different styles because the ways that they painted these paintings show the fall as a dramatic change or an important event in humanity. So this is an overview of how we go over ice. You categorize each sentence. I wrote it down for the sake of demonstration, but you should do it in your head once you have enough practice. And the big thing is too, is that some paragraphs will be very straightforward. It'll have an intro statement, some examples, and it'll tell you why it's important. Others like philosophy ones may just have ideas, some examples, another idea, another example, and it'll ping pong back and forth. So ICE is really helpful in those cases because it'll help you separate the claims or what the author is trying to tell you, the ideas and explanations that they're using to back up what they said, as well as any other ideas mentioned by different people, even if it's not the author. So ICE is just a helpful way to keep track of the passage information. Now what we'll do, since we got that out of the way, is we'll think about what a bottom line summary would be for this one. So I'm just gonna type it here for demonstration purposes. Um, and we'll also do it with some highlights to think about what's important so far. So in this first sentence, we know the most important information is that this is talking about two different artists. So we wanna highlight that. And we know that they painted two important biblical events. So you can definitely highlight that as well. Um, we could highlight this word, but if you have this highlighted so far, it should trigger your memory as to what's going on here. And it tells us in the next sentence that they paint two scenes. And since they don't really talk too much about the exact scene themselves, we're more of what they show, I'm going to highlight who the subject of the painting is because I want to see if the author is going to mention it later on. And what we also know is that these two events form the fall of man. We don't know a lot about the fall of man. So noting that down is really helpful because we can see if the author is going to talk about it later. Here they have an example of how they're painted. I'm not going to highlight anything here because these are just very specific details that they don't really talk about later. And done by the two artists, I'm not going to highlight them again because I mentioned them here. The two images show a stylistic contrast, so that'll be helpful to remember because we're going to know that these two guys may be showing different things in the pair or in the paintings. And we know that it's the two art styles. So I'm not going to bother actually highlighting the art styles because we know they had two different styles. So if you were like, oh, I don't know what art styles they had, keep in mind this highlight here. The contrast is all the more significant. So I would definitely want to highlight significant because it's telling us why this stuff is important. Um, and this is actually telling us why it's important. It's showing the fall as a dramatic change in humanity. So you could have just highlighted the whole thing like that, or you can just highlight the parts individually, whatever is easier for you. So this is an important way of using highlights because if you highlight too much, everything is gonna end up yellow. And it's really hard to use this as a way to go from the question back to the passage. If highlighting is helpful for you, you can just stick to this. But if you wanna try a bottom line summary, we do something really similar. So bottom line summary should be abbreviated, but still specific so that we can keep track of all the ideas they talked about in the paragraph that we want to learn about more later. So one of the big things I want to learn about, for example, is these two painters and how exactly did they paint Adam and Eve in more detail? And is the author going to talk about them in another context? So you could write out Masaccio plus Masolini, or what's even easier, is you can abbreviate it as M&M &M to keep it nice and simple. In terms of what they painted, they painted Adam and Eve. You can either write out their name or just do the abbreviation. And that will tell us that they were showing some Bible events. And then we're going to see that we have this information about the fall of man. So I'll write fall. And I'm going to say it's a dramatic change. So this is a good way to keep track of what they're talking about in paragraph one. We have two important artists. They painted some biblical events with Adam and Eve, and they showed that with different styles of painting, the fall is a dramatic change in humanity. You can put in something like different styles, 
to show that they had different art styles. But to be honest, since the main emphasis is on the fall of man being a dramatic change, because they tell us that this contrast is important because it shows the fall of man as a change in humanity, I want to keep track of the bigger impact and where the author is going to take this argument. So you want to keep your bottom line summary super specific because we want to keep track of where the author talks about these different concepts later on in the passage and also in what context are they talking about. Are they going to tell me more about how m and m are different or similar? Are they going to tell me anything about Adam and Eve? And are they going to actually explain the fall and why it's a dramatic change in humanity? So this is an example of how you can use ICE, how you can use highlighting, and how you can use the bottom line summary. Starting off today, just go ahead and read the rest of this passage. So go ahead and read paragraphs two, three, four, and five on your own. You can practice highlighting to get a feel for it. And once you've highlighted and used ICE to categorize each sentence, go ahead and write a bottom line summary for it. I ask you to do this on your own first because you'll make the most out of the exercise. And even if there's something confusing about the paragraph, use ICE to understand that confusing part and why the author mentioned it. Please read through the entirety of this and only come back to this video once you've finished it so that you can compare your highlights and kind of what you wrote down for your summaries. And we'll also go over the paragraph in depth so you have a better idea of the comprehension aspect of it too and how the different strategies that we covered can help with that. So again, do this on your own and come back to the video after you've finished everything, meaning ICE, the highlights, and the bottom line summaries. All right, so now that you've had a chance to read through the passage, we're going to go over how to use ICE for each paragraph, just so you can kind of like check your work. We'll also go over what they talked about and how to write a summary for each one, as well as what you can highlight. Um, and again, if you find that doing the summary means that you're just writing down what you highlighted, then you can stick to the highlights. Um, if you find that doing the highlights doesn't really help you and the summary is a better way to kind of comprehend everything, do the summary. And if you find that both are helpful for you, then try it out for a few days and see how it helps with your accuracy and timing. So just want to give a heads up for that. And we'll go ahead and categorize this paragraph with ice. So it says the introduction of sexuality inaugurates the need to conceal. And before finding leaves to provide primitive clothing, Adam and Eve employ their arms and hands for that purpose. So this is a great introductory sentence that tells us a little bit about this new topic the author wants to talk about. And how, because we're talking about sexuality, which is talking about Adam and Eve, we need to talk about how they cover themselves because they didn't have any leaves to do that. So since they didn't have leaves to provide themselves some kind of clothing or covering, they used their own body to do that job. So it's an introduction. And you could even say it's a little bit of an example because it's telling us, okay, they need to cover themselves. And then it tells us how they actually do it. So it's an example of what they do. So neither the portions of the body to be covered nor the mechanics of their concealment are accorded any textual specification. And more importantly, within the text, the impulse to screen the body is not differentiated along gender lines. Long sentence, what you do in this case is break it up into pieces. So it basically says, needs the portions of the body to be covered. So what parts they're covering up, nor the mechanics of their concealment. So kind of like how they cover themselves up are accorded any textual specification. Basically, these two pieces of information are not talked about in a text. And if we're thinking about the fact that Masaccio Mussolini painted Bible events, the text is probably the Bible. So the Bible doesn't tell us where Adam and Eve cover themselves or how they cover themselves. And more importantly, so they're adding some more information within the text or the Bible, the impulse to screen the body, so the need to kind of cover yourself like they talked about up here, is not differentiated along gender lines. So the Bible doesn't tell us if guys or girls or Adam or Eve covered themselves up more or less. So it doesn't tell us anything about where they cover themselves, how they cover themselves, and who cover themselves up more. So it's a pretty good example or explanation that backs up this idea that, yes, when you talk about sexuality and concealment, this uh, is related to the Bible, but here's kind of a problem. And if you're an artist, not having any details about how Adam and Eve are painted is going to be pretty difficult.
So the tendency that people might have is to go from this top part and then go to this bottom part that tells us about what their gestures show and all this kind of stuff. Um, and if you skipped over this section, that's okay, because I think it was really, really confusing. But it tells us how you get from this introduction to this conclusion down here. So the conclusion is telling us the artist tended to visualize the fall, which is that fall of man event they mentioned earlier, in such a way that Adam and Eve share one and the same gesture. So they painted Adam and Eve in the same way. The right hand covers the groin and the left arm hides the breast. So you may be thinking, okay, they need to talk about sexuality and covering themselves up. Adam and Eve use their arms and hands to do it. And then at the bottom, oh, well, this is how they show the fall most of the time, and they show them with the same gesture. But it's good to understand why. The why is this middle portion right here, which is that the Bible gives artists no details about how Adam and Eve should be shown. So like where they cover themselves, how they cover themselves, and who's covering themselves up more or less. Um, and because they don't have any details, artists just kind of picked a way to visualize the fall because they didn't have anything to go off of in the Bible. So if you glossed over this section, that's okay for today. But that's where ICE is really helpful because it helps you figure out, okay, here's an intro and here's a conclusion. What's the stuff in the middle that helps me get from the top to the bottom? And ultimately, that's really helpful because it helps you understand the author's argument and what kind of examples that they use to go from this top introduction claim to this bottom conclusion. So in terms of what I would write for a summary, I would probably write down sexuality plus conceal because that's what they start off with introducing. And I would say A and E, Adam and Eve, same gesture. Can you write down the same gestures? Yeah, you definitely can. You could write down some abbreviated form of this stuff right here, like R, H for right hand equals G for groin, or LA equals breast. I've seen a lot of different ways you can write this kind of stuff out. But what's probably more efficient for you is that if you know that the second paragraph is talking about this stuff, if a question asks what kind of gestures Adam and Eve have in a typical painting of the fall, or like very usual painting of the fall, so a hint for what we'll talk about later um, when we go over the questions, then you can just use this and say, oh, they talked about this in the second paragraph, and here's the information right here. Another thing you can do in addition to uh, writing the summaries to kind of highlight this section, so you can definitely highlight, you know, right arm covers the groin and left arm hides the breast. To keep it kind of simple, you can also just highlight this. Adam and Eve share one and the same gesture um, because that will give you an indication of, okay, if I need to know what the gesture is, it's the information right here. Um, but also highlight fall because this is a very important event and we're now just learning a little bit more about how it is. In terms of the top sentence, you can highlight sexuality, um, you can even highlight this, but it's very optional. You can highlight conceal and Adam and Eve use their arms and hands to do that. Some people like to highlight it just to know what they're talking about. Um, this stuff right here is such a big part that it's difficult to figure out, okay, what should I highlight? So I would honestly highlight something like neither and nor so that I know that these are probably pieces of information they can highlight or talk about later in the questions. Um, but one of the things that people do like to highlight is something like not differentiate along gender lines. Do you have to highlight any of this? Not really, uh, because this is the main stuff that you can use to narrow down the main idea. And if you need to go back in the passage to understand this part right here, you definitely can. Um, but the most important stuff is kind of at the top and the bottom. Noting the middle and understanding why the author mentioned it is just very helpful to understand how they got their argument in the first place. So this stuff is completely optional for the middle section. Um, and having these main stuff highlighted right here will, will carry you pretty far. And it also matches up a lot with the stuff that we talked about here. So again, this is kind of like the typical way the artist tended to paint the fall, and they settled on giving Adam and Eve similar gestures because they had no details from the Bible to work off of. So that is the second paragraph. Now we'll go down to the third paragraph. So now that we have that understanding, it kind of transitions into a different topic up here. So we move this down so we have more space to work with. 
So now it's talking about an artist named Masaccio, which is a guy we learned about earlier, so it's very helpful to kind of note this down. So Masaccio's Eve echoes this pose in the activity of the torso, but the pathetic upward gaze and contracted motion of the body withdrawing at the pace of expulsion are original features. A lot of stuff going on, so it's very helpful to kind of break it down. The first thing that we know is now we're finally talking about Masaccio, which means that in this paragraph, they were not talking about Masaccio or Marcellini. It's only about how they typically painted the fall. So Masaccio painted Eve in a way that echoed this pose. So it was pretty similar. And it was similar in her activity of the torso, but the pathetic upward gaze and the contracted motion of the body are original features. So these are the two changes that Masaccio made to this typical way of painting Eve in this case. So it's a good introduction because we're learning about Masaccio and how he changed Eve, but it's also a great example sentence because it tells us, hey, Masaccio changed up Eve and here's exactly how he changed her. So the claim plus the example. In the case of Adam, however, Masaccio alters the model entirely. So this is interesting because it's just telling us that, you know, with the case of Eve, he kind of changed her up a little bit. With Adam, he completely changed how he painted it. And it doesn't tell us how. We don't have any examples like we have here. So it's just an introduction. As he advances parallel to Eve, Adam employs his hands to cover his eyes and screen his sight, not to cover his genitalia. So this is a direct example of how Masaccio actually changed Adam. We don't know it from this sentence, so we find out later on. And this person, Baxendall, is introduced, and Baxendall has pointed out that Adam and Eve's gestures find individual explanation in contemporary physiogenomics. I don't know what this means, so we don't have to worry about it. What's more important is what comes after. It says, after the fall, Eve's pressing her breast with the palm of her hand as a sign of grief, and Adam is covering his eyes with his fingers as a sign of shame. So this is a conclusion because now we finally understand, okay, Masaccio changed up Adam and Eve and he changed their gestures. So why exactly did he change them? Baxendall gives us an explanation. He explains that Masaccio changed the gestures to show different emotions. And this was after the fall. So we know the fall of man had Masaccio and Maslini. They painted two pictures that come together. So the painting that Masaccio made is showing Adam and Eve after the fall. So this is really important to keep track of because it changes how Adam and Eve are being shown. So how would I write a summary for this? Well, I would write down the artist for sure because we finally learn about him. I would say something like Adam and Eve are different because it's showing that they have different gestures and it's just good to keep track of. I would say something like after fall, grief plus shame. So you could write out grief plus shame, or you can just abbreviate it into G plus S. So I want to keep track of the fall because it's a big theme that was in the first paragraph. It was built on in the second paragraph, and now they're very specific about it here. So I want to keep track of what exactly is going on. And if you want to know, oh, should I write down the gestures and all that stuff? Again, you can, just like with paragraph two. But to save yourself some time, it's really helpful to just write the main takeaway and if you really need to go back and figure out those very specific gestures, you can go back to this paragraph using your bottom line summary. But you have plenty of room to work with, so you could abbreviate this into Eve equals breast and Adam or A equals eyes. So you could write something like after the fall, E equals breast, A equals eyes, and that leads to grief and shame. So this is a little bit longer, um, but it's just another version of it. And to keep it simple, I'll cut it down. So it's up to you. If you feel like, oh, I'm definitely not going to remember this, then that's OK. You can use your bottom line summary to come back to the passage. If you feel like, oh, I'm just going to waste too much time coming back to the passage, you can keep it. But for the sake of brevity, I'll just keep it here and again. There's no right or wrong way to write the bottom line summary. It should be a way that triggers your memory. So I'm just giving some examples of how you can do it. And then in terms of what we would highlight, um, I would definitely highlight Masaccio. You can also highlight Eve Echoes' this post. So we know that it's somewhat similar. We can highlight original features so that we know, oops, 
so that we know that Masachu changed up Eve in his own way. And then Adam alters the model. You can even highlight entirely. Uh, it's not required, but basically tells us that he changed up Adam completely. I'm not really going to highlight the examples because they have it down here anyways. Um, and it's also just going to be a lot of yellow, which makes it harder to skim through the passage. We've got Baxendall, and he gives us an explanation of the gestures. So I'd definitely highlight after the fall, and I would highlight grief, and I would just highlight shame. So again, using highlights like bookmarks or kind of a trail of breadcrumbs is really helpful because it'll tell you what information you need to look at. Um, and it's also easier to look at a smaller amount of highlights than just to read this entire thing highlighted. It really defeats the purpose of highlighting, which is to kind of highlight or accentuate some of the more important information. So you can figure out, okay, if I need to know the gestures for grief and shame, it's right here. So this paragraph is pretty interesting because it kind of builds on a lot of the ideas they talk about previously in this paragraph over here. So the two sentiments visualized by Masaccio, grief and shame, only partially coincide with the sentiments mentioned in the Bible, shame and fear. So this is just an introduction that tells us that Masaccio, by changing the painting, shows a little bit different emotions in the Bible. The lack of concordance between image and text was a deliberate choice on Masaccio's part for further scrutiny reveals that Adam and Eve's gestures are not only different, but in one respect complementary. So it's basically saying, well, these two don't agree. Masaccio's painting in the Bible, and it was a very purposeful choice on Masaccio's part. But that part of the sentence isn't really important because that was already talked about up here. What's more important is knowing this part right here. Adam and Eve's gestures are different and they're complementary. So this is a good intro sentence because it just repeats what they said up here and they're giving us some really big information and a new topic that they haven't explained to us. We don't know how Adam and Eve's gestures are complementary. The reason why I'm emphasizing this part more is if you read this initially, you may feel that all this stuff on the top is really important, but what's important to recognize is that the more important main ideas in a passage are going to have more examples. So I wouldn't even bother writing this stuff down in the, um, in the bottom line summary because there are no examples afterwards. Whereas this sentence, based on these two sentences right here, has plenty of examples about how the gestures are complementary. They explain it with Adam screening his eyes so that he can't see, and then Eve covering herself so that Adam can't look at her. Whereas the stuff mentioned in paragraph or in sentence one is not even talked about later in the paragraph. So really what's more important is recognizing that their gestures are complementary, because that's what they build the rest of this paragraph on. And so a man prevents himself from seeing, and woman presents herself from being seen. So another conclusion. And these two parts, again, back up this claim about their gestures being complementary. So this is the more important information that maybe we'd want to write down in a summary or highlight. The relationships genders have division are a result of the fall. So repeating what they said here after the fall, as women experience melancholy and men shame. So a nice conclusion that basically repeats everything they talked about up here. It's saying that after the fall or as a result of the fall, women experience melancholy, which is it's similar to shame, and then men or similar to grief, and then men experience shame. So you may be thinking, how do I know that this is the same as this? It's saying as a result of the fall or after the fall, and we know that's what Masaccio painted, so it's going to be the exact same relationship that they talk about up here. So in terms of what I would write for a summary, I probably wouldn't write down grief and shame again because they already talked about it in the previous paragraph. So I'll focus more on the new information they talked about, which is the stuff about complementary. So I'll say A and E gestures, oops. A and E gestures comp, you can even spell out complementary, um, but using abbreviations is fine. And then after fall, just to kind of repeat that again. <clears throat> 
And you could even, even have something like vision because they talk a lot about seeing and being seen. So these are some of the things you can have. A shorter version would be something like abbreviating this to comp and just saying after the fall because those are the main stuff. But I will leave both versions so they kind of decide on what you want to write it. Um, and yeah, in terms of what we would highlight, it'd be pretty similar. The two sentiments only partially coincide, so I would probably highlight that. And the reason why I'd highlight this is so that I'm not spending all this time highlighting this and highlighting this, which would just add in so many different bits of highlights that would get confusing. So the lack of concordance is, again, just repeating what they set up here, so I'm not going to highlight it. But I'll highlight this so that we know it was something Masachu did on purpose. And because he did it, it shows that their gestures are complementary. These two are examples. So honestly, highlighting the examples can sometimes make stuff confusing. It's sometimes easier to just highlight the stuff that comes before it and then know that the stuff after is an example. And that just takes practice of recognizing, okay, here's a topic and here's an example. Uh, this is a conclusion that sums up what they're saying here, so I'm not really going to highlight it. The main thing I want to know is that how the genders are related to one another, so men and women are a result of the fall, so after the fall, and women experience melancholy and men experience shame which is really similar to what they talked about with Adam and Eve. So you can highlight it, or honestly, you could leave it blank. We already know that this is repeated information, so it's not like entirely important to highlight. And then what we'll go ahead and do is do the last paragraph, which was, I think, one of the more interesting ones in terms of how they structured it. So the complementary contrast between seeing and being seen has now to be checked at the preceding stage. So now we're thinking, okay, what came before what they talked about with the complementary stuff? Uh, the complementary stuff was after the fall, so maybe the preceding stage is before the fall. So this is before the transgression, so it's innocent. So there's no grief and shame. So it's a good intro because so far we don't really know what they're talking about. We just need to know we have to look at the preceding stage or what happened before. Turning to Mussolini's visualization of the temptation, we see things are different. And it kind of tells us how they're different, which is we discover that while Adam is gazing at Eve, she feels no need either to reciprocate or to obstruct the man's gaze. So we're finally talking about Maslini. He had the temptation, which he painted, one of those events that came together to form the fall, which was mentioned in the first paragraph. It's telling us that stuff is different. There's no grief and shame here, and there's no tension. So it's an intro and an example because it's telling us about Mussolini and what he painted, and it's also giving us an example of what he showed. And now it clarifies that it's before the fall and how Adam gazes uninhibitedly at Eve and the focus as well as the quality of his attention is such that Eve can in fact sustain his gaze without discomfort. So the big takeaway is this is just kind of another example that backs up exactly what they said here. There's no discomfort between them and this happened before the fall, which is that preceding stage. So the rest of this stuff here is it's only with the fall or after the fall that woman becomes an uh, object of the gaze and her anxiety. Uh, and then yeah, Adam is barren by embarrassment. This conclusion is just summarizing everything about after the fall. So it's the same thing as the stuff they mentioned in the very beginning about grief and shame. So if we kind of divide this paragraph up, we have Mussolini who painted before the fall, which is when Adam and Eve were fine. And we have Masaccio who painted after the fall, which is when they had grief and shame. So if I'm writing a summary, I would just want to summarize the main stuff that we just learned about. So Mussolini is before the fall. Adam and Eve, no discomfort. And we can keep it pretty simple there. You could always add in Masaccio equals after fall, A and E, grief and shame. This part's not required because it's just repeated information from up here. This stuff is more important to note down because it's new stuff that we just learned about here. But having the two side by side is just helpful and I'm just typing it out for demonstration purposes. In terms of what we would actually highlight, um, I would highlight something like the preceding stage because when I was reading it, I wondered, okay, is this before the fall? And there's some innocence, which is a different emotion than the stuff that we learned about here. 
I highlight Moss Lee because the first time we learned about him, we see things are different. And basically the way that they're different, this is a good example of how they're different. So no need to reciprocate or obstruct. But honestly, the sentence after is better to highlight because it just summarizes everything for us. It's before the fall. Um, there's basically no discomfort between the two of them. And then it's only with the fall that women becomes the object of the gaze. Anxiety, just to kind of hit on what they talked about earlier. This is just repeated information. So it's really, honestly, I wouldn't highlight anything. Um, I would just highlight maybe anxiety and embarrassment. I would highlight with the fall so we know that that's the case, but you can honestly leave this blank because it's just all repeated from previous paragraphs. So that's an example of how to use ICE to kind of sort out, okay, what are the claims the author's making versus the evidence that they use to back it up and why they think it's important. So it's a good way to sort through the information, but the best thing to really do is try out each strategy for two to three days. Uh, do it untimed so you give yourself a chance to really try them out and kind of use this video as a reference to see, okay, how can I go about it? How should I think through it, etc. So three strategies again were ice, highlighting, and the summary for each paragraph. Keep your summary short and sweet. Avoid writing full sentences. Uh, use abbreviations and whatever, like arrows, symbols that will help you uh, basically shorten it down. But we're going to break down each question into one, two, and three, meaning what info do I need from the passage? What is the question asking for? Is it ask, and is it asking me to apply it to a new scenario? So we're just breaking it down the way that we practiced earlier. So it says, which of the following is least likely to be seen in a typical painting of Adam, Eve, in the fall? So least likely, again, you can always highlight the question because it's really helpful, and in a typical painting of Adam and Eve in the fall. So if I'm thinking about the passage and I'm looking at my summaries, for example, the main thing we want to look for, or number one, is what is the typical painting of Adam and Eve in the fall, and what's in that? Then what the question's asking for is what's least likely to be seen in this typical painting? And is it asking you to apply it to new scenarios? No, it's just using information from the passage. So then if I want to think about where they talked about a typical painting, a typical painting is not going to be Masaccio and Mussolini because Masaccio and Mussolini changed their painting entirely and they didn't paint Adam and Eve in the traditional way that they were usually painted. So any paragraphs they talked about, Masaccio and Mussolini, mainly three, four, and five, are going to be out. And the intro paragraph didn't mention anything about a typical painting, so it has to be paragraph number two. So that's what I'm going to be looking at in this case is paragraph number two. And if we go back in the passage, this is where they talk about a typical painting of Adam and Eve in the fall. So this is where I would use most of the information from, but I can also use the rest of the paragraph because it's fair game. And I want to stay here for now and evaluate each answer because the other answers or the other paragraphs talk about Masaccio and Maslini, and they're not related to a typical painting. So that's where bookmarking the information and knowing what paragraph to look for is really important because it just helps you narrow down the search. So what's least likely to be seen in a typical painting? Uh, I'm going to cross out A and B because I know directly from the passage that they're mentioned here that Adam and Eve share these gestures and are shown in a typical painting or usual painting. So it's going to be most likely to be seen in a typical painting, not least likely. Then we're down to C and D, so we need to pick the best answer. The best answer is going to have the most passage evidence. And it's going to match up with what the author is trying to say. So a nude image of Eve, if we go back in the passage, it doesn't really mention anything about a nude image. Um, Adam and Eve are already kind of like nude because they're using their arms and hands to cover themselves up and they don't have any clothes. So C is probably not the best answer. Whereas a fig leaf wearing Adam, meaning Adam is wearing some kind of plants to cover himself up. Here in the passage, it says before finding leaves to provide primitive clothing. So they didn't have any access to find leaves and they didn't have any plants to cover themselves up. And that's the reason why Adam and Eve use their arms and hands. So a typical painting, which has these gestures and they don't have any clothing should not show Adam wearing fig leaves. So this is definitely not gonna be the right answer because there's passage evidence that tells us very clearly that they didn't have 
any leaves, like before finding leaves, Adam and Eve had to cover themselves up with their hand and body. So the whole reason they're using their arms and hands is because they didn't have any leaves to cover themselves up. So Adam should not be wearing a fig leaf, especially if this is how they're showing them, using their arms and hands to cover themselves up. And yep, they kind of gave very similar justification for this. But again, I forgot to mention this earlier, but definitely try out the questions on your own before you jump in and do all of them and practice breaking them down into uh, one, two, and three for the sake of kind of practicing this. Let me copy this just in case it doesn't show up in the next one. Oops. I just want the bottom line. Okay, that didn't work. Okay. So we should be good to go. Um, just let me know if there's any technical issues. Happy to re-record this session, uh, this section. But basically, we went over the first one. We did lose our highlights, but that's OK. We'll go ahead and keep using the same model of those bottom line summaries to kind of figure out what's going on. So I will really, oh, OK, never mind. OK, so we'll just go through the question. Hopefully, you have your bottom line summary saved. I'm not able to share my screen with the other kind of note that I wrote the bottom line summary with, but we have a good grasp of the passage, so we'll kind of use that. So it says, which of the following relationships is most like the suggested relationship of Adam and Eve post-fall in the last paragraph of the passage? So breaking it down into what info we need from the passage, what it's asking for, and if it's asking me to apply it to a new scenario, thankfully this uh, question is a little bit more straightforward. So. This is a reasoning beyond the text because it is definitely asking us to apply it to new scenarios. We've got some scenarios here. And these were not mentioned in the passage, so that's how I know that these are new scenarios. They don't talk about any of these kinds of people. So what info we need from the passage is information about Adam and Eve post-fall. It says to look in the last paragraph, so that's where we'd probably want to go first. And that's going to be everything about this part right here. However, we do know that there's a lot of information that's repeated throughout the passage. And what's repeated throughout the passage is stuff after the fall. So after the fall is repeated here, and it's repeated here. So that's where it's like, OK, you want to stick within the same paragraph. But we know that this is repeated a lot throughout the passage. And this stuff is really related to the same stuff they talk about here. So that's where it's safe to go outside of that bookmarked area you would typically stay in. And I would use the summary that I had for the third paragraph, which was Masaccio Eve and different art styles and then grief and shame. So that's the main stuff I would want to use to answer this question. You can use this or you can just use the summary that you had for the third paragraph. So if they're asking about their relationship post fall, which is grief and shame, what the question is asking for then is which of these is most like the relationship between Adam and Eve post fall. So Adam and Eve post fall was grief and shame. So we need to find the answer that matches up with that relationship of grief and shame. So let's go through which answers we can cross out. Right off the bat, I see answer choice A, a photographer to a famous fashion model. Um, there's going to be no grief and shame here or no discomfort between seeing and being seen, which they talk about in this paragraph and this paragraph and the last paragraph. So it's only with the fall that women is conscious of the object of the gaze, her anxiety at being the object of vision, meaning the person being seen, and then Adam is reluctant to be the agent, meaning the person who's seen. This is the same thing as the information here, whether Adam is looking and he's trying to cover himself up so he can't see, and Eve is trying to cover herself up so she can't be seen. And this is again repeated up here. So it's all grief and shame at one person looking when they shouldn't be, which is Adam, and the other person um, being seen, which is Eve, even though she doesn't want to be looked at. So a photographer is going to be the one looking, and that's their job. And a famous fashion model is the one that is going to be seen, but that's also their job. So there's no discomfort here because both of them are just doing their jobs, and they don't, sh they don't tell us in the answer choice how they feel and if it's bad. So there's nothing negative here. Then another one that stands out is a baseball hitter to the pitch that will win a game. If the person who needs to hit the ball is looking at the pitch of the ball that will win the game, uh, the hitter wants to look at it, and there's nobody who doesn't want to be seen because it's a pitch or a ball. So there's no grief and shame here. 
A sculptor to the sculptor's Michelangelo's most famous work. So one sculptor is looking at another sculptor's really famous sculpture. Um, so there's one person who's looking at the sculptor's work. So maybe like some famous statue or something. And then the other person has their work being looked at. There's no grief or shame here because one person is just looking at another statue made by another sculptor. So it may be more of like admiration, but no grief and shame. And here, a mother to the televised execution of her son. The mother is going to be watching even though maybe she doesn't want to because she's grieving her son who's going to be killed. And the son may not want to be looked at because being executed is a shameful thing and that kind of stuff. So this is going to be the best answer because... We narrowed down that the main information we need to know is how Adam and Eve, um, their relationship is like after the fall, which is grief and shame based on our summaries that we had. And then we need to find the answer that matches up with that. So C is going to be the best answer. Oh, okay, give me one second. Okay, we are back in business. So we figured out that the answer is going to be C. And they kind of give very similar justification for it. Um, and yeah, let's go ahead and do the next question. So which of the following author, which of the author's assertions is most susceptible to empirical verification or refutation? So this is going to be a tough one in terms of wording. Um, if we're thinking about one, two, and three, what info we need from the passage? what the question is asking for and is asking to apply new scenarios. No new scenarios because these are all assertions the author made. Uh, in terms of what info we need from the passage, we don't need anything specific because all of these are author's assertions. And what the question is asking for is which of these assertions is most susceptible to empirical verification or refutation. So basically, which answer choice could we actually verify if we had a source of information like Google or in this case, since everything is based on the Bible, uh, which of these answers would be able to be checked to be true or false based on the Bible? So if we want to answer that susceptible to empirical verification or refutation, aka you want to fact check the answer, then you need to pick the answer that is the most objective. So a subjective answer is going to be up for interpretation, meaning if you know you, me or another person disagrees with it, then the answer can actually be checked to be true or false. Whereas an objective answer will just be clear cut right or wrong. And we're going to look for which answers have the most subjective wording. So wording that's up for interpretation or very emotional, whereas which one can be actually fact checked. So here the fall depicts a dramatic change in the state of humanity. Dramatic, that's a pretty big uh, subjective term because the fall again is a painting. So how someone interprets it can be different. I can think it's dramatic and you may think it's not important at all. Um, so again, also the fall is a Bible event, so how you and I interpret it can be different. And state of humanity is also a very big concept that's hard to define between people. The way that I define it could be different than the way you define it or anyone else can be. So this one I think is a very subjective answer, and I may not consider it. Masaccio Masani painted two important biblical events. So... This right here, we can actually verify with the source of information. So we know that they painted the temptation and the expulsion. So if we know that these are two biblical events, we can open up the Bible and say, okay, are these uh, only talked about in like a sentence or two or in a paragraph, or do they have pages dedicated to them or a whole chapter? Um, and which one of these is more important to the Bible as a whole? So we can check this more likely than not, and it's more objective. The covered eyes of Masaccio's Adam suggest he feels guilty. Um, this is, again, based on a painting. So it's based on Masaccio's painting of Adam and Eve. And this is an emotion. So this is based on how Michael Baxendahl actually interpreted the painting. Um, and so his interpretation could be different at how I look at it or how you look at it. So for that reason, C is not going to be a good answer because it's very subjective. It's based on how someone interprets a painting. And for the same reason, Masasu's temptation is another painting. And Eve feeling comfortable with Adam's gaze is, again, showing another emotion. 
And so if I were to look at the temptation versus you or anyone else, we could all interpret it differently. And I may say, oh, Eve is comfortable, whereas you may not. Um, so this is more subjective. And again, we would not want to go with the subjective answer. This is the most objective one. So again, if they talk about empirical verification or refutation, basically, which, which answer source could actually be verified as true or false with the source of information? And so you want to pick the answer that's the most objective or can be checked with facts. So here, the discussion of sentiments visualized by Masaccio best supports the passage assertion. So again, one, two, and three, what info the passage is asking us to look at is actually nothing specific in this case. Um, or actually, never mind. It is actually looking at something specific, which is the discussion of sentiments visualized by Masaccio. So what emotions did Masaccio show in this painting? which based on our bottom line summaries, we wrote down grief and shame for Masaccio. And the first time that they showed Masaccio was in paragraph three. So it's gonna be starting off here and this is the main part we wanna look at. We can also maybe look at paragraph four um, because it really elaborates on everything that they talk about up here. So those are also safe things to keep in mind, but sticking to paragraph two first is probably the best way to go about it. So they talk about the discussion of sentiments and then what is the question asking for? Basically, what does it support? So which of these claims are supported by this discussion of sentiments? So I would actually go about this by categorizing each answer as to what paragraph it's in and if the information they talk about is actually related to this discussion of sentiments. So grief and shame. If the answer is related to it, then I would keep it. If it's talking about different stuff, then I wouldn't even think about it. So Adam and Eve are usually painted in similar manners. So was that talked about in this paragraph right here? No, it was talked about in the paragraph before, which shows them with the same gesture. So this is in paragraph two. And is this important to them talking about grief and shame? No, because this is not how Masaccio paints Adam and Eve. This is the typical way. So I would actually cross this answer out because it's not relevant to the sentiments visualized by Masaccio and how Masaccio painted Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve and Arhan, unhappy for two different reasons. Um, this one is a possible answer because it shows here that they have grief and shame and that they're unhappy. And it kind of repeats that over here as well. So this is in paragraph two and paragraph three. Um, and it's related to the sentiments that they show, grief and shame, so I'd keep it. Adam and Eve use their arms and hands to cover their bodies. That is talked about in paragraph two, and is it related to this, or not paragraph, yeah, paragraph two, um, and is it related to the discussion of their emotions that Masaccio shows, which is grief and shame? No, it's just telling us that Adam and Eve need to cover themselves because of this issue of sexuality. It has nothing to do with these sentiments of grief and shame. And then Adam and Eve are central to two important events in the Bible. Um, that's in paragraph one, basically, which says that they take part in two important biblical events. Um, it doesn't even say that Adam and Eve are central to the important events in the Bible. We're kind of just in, uh, inferring that based on the fact that they're in the paintings. So this answer is definitely out. And it also doesn't even talk about anything about grief and shame with this claim. So the best answer is B, because it's telling us that when we talk about these sentiments, this is the claim that it backs up. And it shows that they have grief and shame and that they're not satisfied and they're kind of like dynamic. So that's going to be the best answer in this case because it matches up with the info we need from the passage and what the question is asking for. Then the author explained that Masaccio's painting, oops, this is probably from a previous time. The author explains that Masaccio's painting of Adam and Eve is different from most painters because. So again, one, two, and three, what info is the question asking for? Uh, what is the question asking for? And then do we apply it to a new scenario? So the info that we need is Masaccio's painting of Adam and Eve and how it's different. And what the question is asking for is that the author explains that his painting is different because. So basically, why does the author say the painting is different? And is it asking you to apply it to new scenarios? No, these are all mentioned in the passage, so it's not new information. So where they talk about Masaccio's painting of Adam and Eve and it being different, if we think about our bottom line summaries, the first time that we learn about Masaccio is paragraph three. 
So that's the main thing we would want to just bookmark and keep in mind. But let's first start by crossing out some answers as to why maybe the author thought that their painting was not different from other artists. So we know that most artists show the fall with these same gestures, and then Masaccio makes a bunch of different changes. So the author explains that Masaccio's painting of Adam and Eve is different than most painters because he depicts Eve as comfortable with Adam's gaze. That is not related to what Masaccio is talking about. This is in the last paragraph, which is what Mussolini does. So that's not related to the information we're using. Um, the author explains that his painting is different because it departs from sentiments in the Bible. They mention that down here, but it's not the main reason that Masaccio's painting is different. The main reason that Masaccio's painting is different is that he changes how Eve looks and that he changes how Adam looks. And he gives them different gestures and what they show in the fall. And even Michael Baxendale emphasizes that here. So this stuff right here is just building off of what they talk about in the previous paragraph. It's not important to how Masaccio's painting is different. It's just a supporting detail that they kind of throw in there. So gives Adam and Eve different gestures. It definitely matches up with everything we talk about in this paragraph, as well as this paragraph right here. But mainly, it's really talking about everything they talk about here, which is that his painting is different from the way they typically paint it because he shows different gestures, and from that, he shows different emotions. So this is probably our best answer. And then it's different because he paints Adam covering his groin and chest. Not the case because he's actually covering his eyes in the painting. Masachi is not painting Adam covering his groin and chest, so that's out. So this is the best answer because it matches up with info from the passage that we know from what's in the question, as well as what the question's asking for. And lastly, let me clean this up a little bit. Which view expressed by the author is most important for readers to share if they're convinced of the merits of the author argument? So what info we need from the passage? Nothing specific because all of these are views by the author. But then what is the question asking for, which is the second question we ask ourselves, is which of these answers would back up the merits of the argument? Meaning basically, which of these answers would support the main idea or the author's argument? And it's kind of like an underlying part of every argument that they mention. So we're basically looking for which answer matches up with the main idea or main uh, argument of the author. So here it says painters can get into the minds of their subjects. Uh, so for every answer, of course, I want to think, does it have an example from the passage and did the author talk about it? So is there any examples of painters getting into the minds of their subjects? No. It just shows painters showing the emotions of Adam and Eve. The fall really happened as it's depicted in the paintings. The author never mentions this or talks about if the fall actually happened, so not a problem. People avoid looking at something that has changed too much. The author never talks about avoidance or anything changing. It just talks about the different emotions that Mussolini and Masaccio painted in their paintings. And feelings can be communicated through gestures. This one's probably the best answer because they talk about here, different gestures, how different gestures that Masaccio shows shows different emotions, and then different gestures that Mussolini shows shows very different emotions. So that matches up best with the main idea as well as different examples they talk about. So again, this is kind of like a way that you can reinforce the steps and use it to just figure out what information to apply, as well as um, kind of how to apply and what the question is asking for so that the questions become less confusing. But yeah, that's basically it for our session. And thank you for watching.